Hello. In the previous video, we were talking about how filters can be classified based on the amplitude portion of their frequency response. And they can be classified as low pass, high pass, band pass, or band reject, also known as notch filters. Now, the types of responses that we can see in this figure, these block type responses with a perfectly flat pass band and a very sharp uh, distinction between the pass band and the stop band, these are ideal filter responses. Um, actual filters typically do not possess these ideal characteristics. And so a typical response of an actual filter may look more like something like this with some ripple in the pass band. Um, then there is some transition region before we reach the stop band. Um, normally, uh, all filters in all filters, we can differentiate these three regions, the pass band region, the transition region, and the stop band region. The cutoff frequency, by definition, uh, is the frequency at which a magnitude response drops 3 dBs from the nominal passband magnitude. Um, normally, we do have some ripple. Uh, the passband ripple is the maximum variation in the passband. There is typically also some ripple in the stop band. Um, the stop band attenuation is the minimum signal attenuation within the stop band. And so a typical filter specification is that by the time it enters its stop band at X frequency, the attenuation needs to be a minimum of negative 40 dB, for example. Um, so that will be considered the stop band attenuation is the worst case stop band attenuation. And then the stop band frequency is the frequency at which uh, the magnitude response enters that stop band region. Based on uh, these characteristics, we typically define the filter specifications and we also get to assess the filter performance. Uh, typical filter design specifications are the flatness of the passband, which will typically be given as a minimum amount of passband ripple the sharpness of the roll-off, which typically is expressed as the minimum stop band attenuation, as we have mentioned, by the time we enter the stop band, we want to have a minimum of X dBs of attenuation or negative X dBs of attenuation. Now, there is a design trade-off between those two in that typically the flatter the pass band and the sharpest the roll-off, uh, the more complex the filter. And so we typically want to find a filter that will be as simple as possible while still achieving our desired specifications. Now, the complexity of a filter is determined by the filter order, which we're going to refer to with the letter N. And uh, the order of the filter basically indicates the number of poles in the transfer function of the filter. Now, in addition to the amplitude response and with the ripple and the minimum stop and attenuation, uh, the filter also affects the phase of a signal and how it affects the phase of a signal is measured by the phase response of the, of the frequency response. Frequency response contains both the magnitude response and the phase response. Uh, the phase response of a filter also depends on uh, one, the type of filter, whether it be a low pass, high pass, band pass uh, or band reject. As we can see in this graph, uh, we have the uh, variation of the phase um, with respect to frequency. So this will be the change in phase from input to output versus frequency for different types of filters. Uh, an all pass, a band pass, a high pass, a low pass. And you can see that the phase angles uh, vary based on the different filters. So in the low pass filter, for example, and this will be the case for a, uh, a two pole system it will go from 0 to negative 180 degrees. In the case of a high pass filter, it goes from 90 to negative 90, etc. And so the, the phase response is going to depend first on the type of filter that we have, but also the order of the filter, uh, which is determined again by the number of poles. And so we can see uh, typically uh, the, the higher the order of the filter, uh, the more or less amount of delay, the more amount of delay we are going to experience overall, the, the more uh, shift in phase uh, with frequency. Uh, notice also that the phase response can be uh, less steep or more steep 
and uh, that's also a parameter that depends on the order of the filter and is typically characterized by the Q factor of the filter or the quality factor. Uh, for a lower quality factor, we typically are going to have a smoother uh, phase response and for a high quality factor, Q20 for example, we're going to see a sharper phase response. In addition to the frequency response, we can also characterize a filter based on its time domain response. Um, and there are, there are two particular responses that we consider as part of the time domain response. One is the impulse response, and then there is the step response. And both give us important information about the filter. Uh, the impulse response, obviously, is the response of the filter um, to an impulse signal. And an impulse signal is defined as a signal that it's a, a very narrow pulse that is infinitely high, infinitely narrow, um, and, and covers an, a unity area. Uh, it's impossible to provide a, a, a perfect impulse at the input of a filter. Uh, it's impossible to generate a perfect impulse. But if, if you generate something that is close to an impulse, as close as possible, uh, you can get to an impulse. What is the response of your filter? If you provide that as the input, what do you get at the output? That will be the impulse response. It's the response of the filter to an input signal. The step response is the response of the filter to a step signal, which is basically just uh, an abrupt change in level. Um, it could be characterized as a, a perfect square pulse. Now, the impulse response of a system uh, it can be shown that it's proportional to the bandwidth of the filter. And specifically, uh, the, the narrower the impulse response, um, the higher the bandwidth of the system. For the step response, what we are interested in determining is the amount of overshoot and the amount of ringing. Uh, the overshoot is going to tell us how far above the final value, final output value, the signal is going to go before eventually settling into that final value. So how much it overshoots from that nominal output value. And the ringing is, is going to determine uh, how much of an oscillation there is around the final value until the signal eventually set, settles into that uh, final value. And so it's going to affect the settling time of that signal as well. Um, both impulse response and step response calculations are mathematically involved. And so they're, they're typically just determined using the simulator. Um, they're not typically performed mathematically. Now, we mentioned there are uh, several filter designs based on the transfer functions and uh, specifically how the, how the poles are located in, in the transfer function in the complex plane. Um, normally, we can, we can choose from a variety of them, and there will be uh, several of them that will meet a certain uh, set of specifications. Uh, but, you know, based on whether we want to optimize the amplitude response, the phase response, or the time domain response, we may choose one type of filter over another. And basically what we're choosing is the particular type of transfer function. So the um, Butterf Butterworth filter, for example, um, is the, has the best compromise between uh, magnitude response and phase response. It provides maximum flatness, which means that it has no ripple in the passband or the stop band, uh, but it has a wide transition region, so it doesn't have a very sharp roll-off. Uh, the transient performance is average. It's, uh, it's not very good, but it's also not very bad, we could say. Uh, the Chebyshev filter uh, typically has a smaller transition region than the battery world, meaning it has a sharper roll-off but it achieves this at the expense of uh, ripple in the passband. And the Chebyshev filter basically tries to minimize uh, the, the height of the maximum ripple that's known as the Chebyshev criterion. And again, those, the two transfer functions are different from each other. The poles, in the case of a Butterworth filter, they all lie on the unity circle, and they are equidistant uh, around that unity circle. Uh, in the Chebyshev filter, they lie on, on an ellipse. Um, and that's what gives them their different characteristics. The, whereas the Butterworth filter uh, improves the amplitude response of part of the frequency response, and the Chebyshev filter improves the 
um, the sharpness of the filter, so also going to the amplitude part of the frequency response. The Bessel filter um, basically optimizes the time domain response. It has better transient response, uh, impulse response, step response, so it has less overshoot, better settling time, um, but it has worse frequency domain characteristics. And so, again, depending on what parameter you're trying to optimize, you might choose from between these three types of filters or a variety of other filters that are available as well. Um, this graph provides, uh, or this set, set of graphs, provide uh, a visual representation of the frequency response and time domain response for those three types of filters, the Butterworth, Chebyshev, and Bessel, so that we can um, qualitatively look at how they compare. So the first two plots are the frequency response. The first one will be the amplitude response. The second one will be the phase response. And the two bottom plots are the time domain response. The first one is the step response, the response to a step function. And the second one is the impulse response of the filter. So we can see, as we mentioned, that the, uh, the Butterworth filter has um, identified in pink here, has the flatter pass band. Um, it doesn't have a, a very good um, uh, roll-off. It doesn't have a very sharp roll-off. The Chebyshev filter has a sharper roll-off than the Butterworth does, uh, but it has that ripple in the passband. And then the Bessel doesn't really have the best um, frequency domain performance. Um, you can see that it starts rolling off very early, and it has a very large uh, transition region there. However, when you look at the time domain response, you can see that the Bessel filter is the one uh, that has the flatter uh, and the fastest time domain response as it settles in the step response, settles with essentially uh, no overshoot and no ripple. And then in the impulse response, it's also the one that has uh, kind of the, the fastest settling time and basically no ripple. The Butterworth and the Chebyshev, you can see that they both have a certain amount of overshoot, certain amount of ripple, and in this case, the Chevy-Chef uh, with a higher phase delay than the Butterworth as it has uh, the steeper roll-off. So, again, uh, there's nothing to say, you know, one of them is absolutely better than another. And typically they have been designed uh, to optimize different parameters. So, now, uh, when we're doing filter design, a lot of the uh, different parameters, different transfer functions uh, for the different filters come tabulated. These are calculations that are difficult to perform. They have been performed. Um, in the past, but it's the kind of thing that, you know, you want to compute once and be done with it. And so a filter design used to be done um, a lot with tables and graphs and things like that um, that have already had already been developed. So you will select uh, based on the parameters that you have, the specs that you have, the, the type of filter that you want, the order of your filter, and then you will uh, refer to the tables to come up with all the different um, characteristics, parameter, uh, transfer functions, circuits, etc. Um, nowadays it's still done a lot that way, uh, but there are also certain methodologies that we are going to learn. In particular, we are going to apply them to the Butterworth type filter uh, to see how, you know, how we could use those tables to perform our um, high order filter design. Nowadays with the advent of simulators, um, you know, there's, there's um, a lot of information available from the simulator and you don't need to refer to the tables for everything, but they're still, they're still good and valid and uh, certainly a good tool to use for your filter design. So, uh, the general procedure when we are designing a filter, we are first going to select what type of filter we want to design based on our required specs and what type of filter is going to involve, you know, is this a low pass, a high pass, uh, is it going to be um, an analog filter versus a digital filter, but hopefully if, if we are studying um, analog electronic circuits, we are interested in analog circuits. So uh, if you select an analog filter, what is the type of filter based on uh, what frequencies you want to attenuate or, um, or amplify? Then what type of filter perhaps do you want a Butterworth, do you want a Chevy Chef, do you want a Bessel, do you want a different type? Uh, what is the order of the filter? That will be the, the second step. 
the minimum filter order that you need to meet your specifications based on the particular transfer function you've selected. And then you start with a normalized prototype circuit, um, which is basically a, a circuit that performs a particular transfer function with all the values set to one. So it has a one radian per second of cutoff frequency as a gain of one, etc. So you start with your normalized prototype circuit, and then you use um, the methods of frequency scaling and impedance scaling to determine your final component values for the particular cutoff frequency and the particular gain that you want. Now we're going to see some examples of how this is uh, done in the practice. And as you will see, for uh, lower order filters, for first order and even second order filters, these steps may seem like unnecessary steps. Uh, they can be done fairly straightforward. But we should say that uh, as the order of the filter gets higher, uh, the, the process becomes more cumbersome and therefore having uh, more of a standard methodology uh, will allow us to design the filter in a simpler manner, but also in a manner that is less prone to error. Thank you.